lot of rumblings about using insects as a food and feed source in the future. Um, there was a paper that came out in 2013 that the United Nations wrote that really touted all of the benefits of using insects. And there are a lot of benefits. But um, there's a lot of misinformation out there too. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know about insects as food and feed and what some of the challenges are for the industry and where it's going. So that's a lot to cover. Um, I, I started, I got into this industry by kind of a circuitous route um, when I first decided that I was interested in getting into this space, which was about two and a half, three years ago. Uh, I took some time to really research the space and try to understand why, why wasn't it already a giant thing, right? If insects are such a huge opportunity, then why am I not seeing more of this? I don't want to jump into something if there's not really an opportunity there, so I did some research. And I started by uh, creating an art project called the Entomophotron. And I did this in collaboration with a nonprofit organization called Gorilla Science that uses interactive art as a vehicle for science education. So a few years ago, I found myself in Brooklyn hanging out at Pratt Institute in their fabrication lab and building an edible insect experience station, a 1950s style diner that we were going to take to a 60,000 person festival in Oregon. This is, this is how you get pulled, roped into the edible insect space. Um, and we, it, it was a big hit, and we started taking it to other festivals. So now this art has been to about six different festivals. Most recently, I went to Burning Man about a month ago. Um, and through this, we've learned a lot about what people think about edible insects. And, um, and what most people seem to know about edible insects is the kind of the infographic that you see online, right? So they know that you know, maybe it's more space efficient or feed efficient or water efficient, how much more efficient. Now, this is uh, an infographic from a nonprofit organization called Little Herds, and most of the data that they use for those infographics come from the 2013 report. Now, 2013 was actually about six years ago, right? And the data in that report was from many years before that. And you know, in, in that process, kind of this telephone game that goes from journalist to journalist or from blogger to blogger online, we start to see some degradation in the data. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about setting these numbers straight. Now, for one, I, I think that we actually don't quite know what the food conversion rate of insects actually is when it's grown at industrial scale, because we have very, very little R&D that has gone into this space. So the bug of choice that I work with in my company, what we've done our most research on is a cricket. And within crickets, we study Acata domesticus as the species. Now, if you look at the scientific literature, you can find uh, studies that show that the feed conversion rate for Acata domesticus is 0.9. And you can also find studies that show it's 2.3. That's a pretty big difference in terms of feed conversion rate. Um, there's a lot that we really don't know here. And then you can also find some academic literature that goes through life cycle analyses of the ecological footprint of growing these species. And you hear a lot about, you know, there's a lot of different variables that you can track. Now, which one is most important? That's really very difficult to say. So it's very difficult to say, is a cricket more sustainable than a chicken or a fish or a shrimp or a soybean, right? And what I would argue is that there are two variables that really, really matter, and that's input and output, right? The feed that's going in, to the quality of protein that's going out. It's not just the quantity of protein, it's the digestibility of that protein, it's the type of protein, where protein is made up, a series, made up of a series of amino acids, some of which are more valuable than others in our agricultural supply chain, and some of which are easier to digest than others, depending on the source that they're coming from. Um, another thing that I'd like to talk about is that if you're researching this online, there's a big difference between feed conversion rate and uh, ECI, efficiency of conversion of ingested food, which is kind of a fancy thing that entomologists like to talk about um, when they're exploring these topics. So one of the biggest problems that I see in blog posts about edible insects is that they'll compare raw beef to dried cricket. They'll say, wow, you know, crickets are tw have twice as much protein as beef, but it's not true because really you'd have to compare the dry weight of beef to the dry weight of cricket and that's something that's not always happening. So I'm, um, as much as I love insects and I think that they're the future of feed, I also really like, as someone who cares about data, I also like to set some numbers straight when I talk about this. 
Um, in that 2013 report, now I, I have all the respect for the folks that put that report together. It is a 300 page report. A lot of people contributed to it. There is a lot of data in there and it's really, really interesting. I think it's done a lot to really propel our industry forward. But we also need to continue doing research on this space because what we have from 2013 isn't enough. So if you look at these two quotes, which is what a lot of the infographics that you see online are based on these numbers from that report, you'll see that they're from 2002 and 2005. That's a long time ago. Things change in that time. And also things change depending on whether or not you're studying things in a laboratory or if you're studying them at industrial scale on a farm. So um, for example, this is a 20, 2005 paper. And if you look at this part that I highlighted here, it shows that the greatest survival, 47.5% of Akeda domesticus was achieved at you know, XYZ. But I, as a cricket farmer, look at this, I say 47% for survival, you mean you were killing 53% of your crickets and these are the numbers that we're using to base an entire industry off of? Wow, if I kill 53% of my crickets, I am an unhappy cricket farmer, a very unhappy cricket farmer, right? And, and I don't blame the people who studied this, you're trying to grow crickets in a lab study, in a lab conditions, right? You have um, PhD students who are not professional cricket farmers, they haven't been doing it their entire lives and they're trying to grow it in some suboptimal sub condition in a lab. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do and I think there's a lot that we still don't know here. And then in the 2002 one, um, this report is talking about chickens and the feed conversion of 2.5. Now we know that as an industry, the feed conversion of poultry is more like 1.6, right? So that just to, goes to show that when you're studying things in a lab or you're studying things in different conditions, you're going to have different results. And so, um, and, and I'd also like to mention that over time, feed conversion and feed efficiency for poultry has gone way, way down. And how did that happen? Through research, through optimization, through a whole series of small changes that we've made. And we're just getting started with insects. And so I think that the true number that we will arrive at is something that no one truly knows yet. Um, now I think there are a lot of opportunities to improve in the insect feed space. Um, for one, there's a lot of opportunity to use agricultural byproducts for insects. Insects evolved to eat a whole range of different products. And I think this is really where the opportunity comes in. Um, another opportunity is to time it correctly. Right? I think that perhaps in, in some of these lab studies, if you're not harvesting it at exactly five to six weeks, you're not getting the optimal growth time and you do get diminishing returns over time. And then I think there's also a, a really big opportunity in tracking. How do you measure what your die-off rate is over time? If you're losing 53% of your crickets, when are you losing them and under what conditions? Uh, and that's a very, very difficult thing to track. Um, as you know, when you, when you have a big house of poultry and you can cull a certain number of birds every day and you can count that number of birds, it's somewhat easy to track. But when you have 1.5 million crickets that you're growing every week, how do you count those dead crickets? Yeah, right, and how do you do that in a labor efficient way? Um, and so uh, what I've been pondering over over the past two and a half years in a full-time way is how do you scale bugs? How do you grow insects efficiently? Because, you know, insect farming isn't new. Humans have been farming bugs for thousands of years in, in various parts of the world. And, uh, and humans also have been farming bugs commercially in the United States since the 1940s. Um, so actually the first cricket farms in America showed up in the 1940s, first to serve the fish bait market. And then in 1990, in the 90s, Jurassic Park came out and it became cool to have a pet lizard. And then this whole market for 12 year olds with bearded dragons cropped up. And now the, the market for live feeder insects in the United States is actually a $100 million industry every year. Um, we sell to zoos and aquariums and pet breeders and individuals that have lizards and chameleons and that kind of thing. But the way that we farm crickets today really hasn't changed much since the 1940s. Where you look at a mature industry like poultry, 
that has thousands of years of human innovation, billions of dollars in research and development that has been poured into making that industry scalable and efficient, there's been very little that has been dumped into insects. And so right now, labor accounts for about 75% of costs on cricket farms. So two and a half years ago when we started, I identified this as a really big problem. And so I put together a team with some engineers and entomologists. My background is in uh, data analysis software. And we started looking into this problem of how do you reduce labor? How do you build automated systems that can help you scale these insects? And it's, it's not easy. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, an engineer will look at a cricket and say, oh, they need, they need airflow. Okay, well, the answer to that is you put a little computer fan on the side of the bin, and the computer fan goes into the, the bin of crickets, right? They're just like little server racks, right? You just cool it down the same way that you cool down servers. Well, that causes your crickets to die because it, the wind produces too much stress on them. They do need airflow, but they need it in different ways. Similar. Okay, crickets need water. How do you water them? Well, guess what? We have watering systems that have been designed for vertical greenhouses and for chicken waters. But you know what? If I said to a cricket, you know what? I'll give you, I'll give you a dollar if you can figure out a way to drown in this droplet, this one single droplet of water here that's on the side of your bin. They will figure it out. They will prove you wrong every time. Crickets are excellent at drowning. <laughs> So you have to think about the, the unique biology of the insect when engineering systems for them. Um, engineering systems that are cleanable, that you can prevent bacterial buildup, that, you know, that won't kill your bugs, that will help them survive. Because you, you look at the cricket and you think, oh, that's, that's an infinitely scalable thing, right? One female cricket can lay 300 eggs, takes six weeks for her to grow to adulthood. By my calculations, crickets should overtake humans in about two years, right? But they don't because they assume the crickets are, are structured in a way in nature where they are losing the vast majority. So when they lay 300 eggs, it's really just, you know, I hope that 1% of you survive. And that's about all you can hope for. But we're hoping that more than 53% of them survive. And that's what we're up to growing crickets. So I, I can, I'm a cricket farmer, ask me anything. I also grow worms and roaches. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. The question was whether or not we were growing primarily for the pet industry or if we're still interested in human food. So the interesting thing about crickets is that it's a really high quality protein that can be used in a broad range of different applications. And the application that we've always been interested in, the direction that we're going, is serving the aquaculture and aquafeed market. There is a huge need in aquafeed. It's more than a $100 billion market for aquafeed right now. And right now it's pretty reliant upon fish meal, which is a $9.5 billion industry. Uh, which is a limited resource. There are only so many fish in the sea that we can harvest every year. So it's an unstable market, it's a volatile market, and it's not a scalable market. And so there's a lot of investment right now in alternative proteins that can go into aquafeed. And insects are one of the more promising ones um, because they grow so efficiently and because they can feed on agricultural byproduct streams. Um, so that's the market, that's where we're going, right? But that market doesn't exist right now. I don't have 10 million, you know, 10,000 metric tons of cricket powder that I can feed into the aquaculture market. So we start with our current market that exists, which is the live pet food market. And you can make a decent living in that market. So it actually gives us a really good way to have early customers, early revenue, and use that as a lily pad to get to other markets. Now there are a couple of markets in between here and aquafeed that we could serve. The pet food market is very, very interested in using insects to replace some of the beef and pit, pork and things like that that are in the feeds. Um, and there are some very large players in that space that have been researching those opportunities pretty extensively. And then there's also the human food market and we get requests for human food every day. Uh, we haven't moved into that market yet, partly because the margins in the exotic pet market are so high and the compliance requirements in the human food market are also so high. Um, but we would definitely like to serve that market too. Yeah. Why crickets and not black soldier fly larvae? Do you guys have like 
45 minutes. <laughs> um, all right, so there are three main insects that have received the most investment in this space. There's black soldier fly larvae, there's mealworms, and there's crickets. Black soldier fly larvae um, arguably, arguably had the first large investment. And the reason for that is because black soldier fly larvae, they've been studied for many, many decades in um, waste management plays because they, they're amazing insects. They can feed off of literal human waste, poultry waste, uh, pig manure, that kind of thing. They can eat manure and turn it into something less harmful for humans, less laden with bacteria. And that's amazing. That's very, very cool. And so the promise of being able to feed waste that otherwise you would have to pay a large amount of money to dispose of to an insect and have them convert it into protein is, is an amazing pitch. I mean, it just wins every time. You do the math and it works. However, the problem is that when you're feeding something that goes into the human food supply, every part of that path has to be food grade, right? So if the black soldier fly larvae are being fed to chickens that are being fed to humans, what you feed the black soldier fly larvae also needs to be able to safely go into that chain. And since human poop has a whole host of bacteria, heavy metals, other, other things that can bioaccumulate in the insects, it's not approved as a feed source. So what ended up happening in the black soldier fly larvae industry is that they received a ton of investment under this promise, but now they're using the same agricultural byproduct streams that we could also use to feed crickets. And pound for pound on a protein basis, um, black soldier fly larvae, I don't want to get the number wrong, but it's about 60% of the protein that crickets do. A defatted cricket meal can be upwards of 80, 85% crude protein, whereas a defatted black soldier fly larvae is about 65%. This is just, just the raw numbers. It's 40 to 45% for BSFL, I believe, and about 65% for crickets. And um, the, the quality of the protein, as I understand it, is higher. It's more digestible and has more of the key amino acids that you need. So if you're feeding them the exact, this is our hypothesis, and I would love to have a BSFL person right beside me so that we can just like battle head to head on stage. Um, but the reason why we chose crickets is because for the, the, if you're feeding them the exact same input material, they're going to have a higher quality output material. And then beyond that, um, there's one other factor that I should mention, which is that BSFL are, are pretty easy to grow. They self-harvest, um, which is pretty neat. And so I think that removed a lot of the barriers to entry for early scaling for BSFL. But with crickets, if you can figure out how to grow them, and they're terrible to grow, I don't recommend it. If you can automate that process, I think the bang for the buck is going to be a lot higher. That was not quite 45 minutes, but I think I got most of it. Other questions? Yeah. The question is, do I have to do a lot of education for people who are regulating our industry? Um, right now, no, because our industry is in the exotic pet market, right? And that, that market has existed for a long time. And so there are certain insects, we ship live insects to our customers, and there are certain live insects that you can't ship across state lines, but that's all pretty well codified and well known. So right now, no. But in the future, um, Yes and no. There have been some pioneers before us who have largely figured that out in the human food space. So that's a well-known process that we can just kind of copy paste. And then, um, and there may be problems as that scales. There may be other regulations that crop up. There are always other regulations that crop up. But right now it is possible and feasible and there are North American farms that grow crickets for human consumption and sell them on Amazon. Um, and then in the aqua feed space, there are some more regulatory requirements to, to jump through. BSFL has been approved as a feed for salmonids in the United States, but other insect species have not. Um, now they will be, but you need to be you need to go through that whole process. In Europe, 
uh, crickets, mealworms, and BSFL have all been approved as salmonid feed in the EU. So it's unlikely that the United States would not approve those species. It does take time. Other questions? Any other questions? All right, please Thank you. join me in thanking Trina.